Good morning. Welcome all of you to our second Sunday after Pentecost. Today is many things. Today is Father's Day. My congratulations, love, and appreciation to all fathers. Uh, as I remember my own father, today is my father's birthday. Often on Father's Day they would occur. My mother's birthday was the 15th of May. Often would occur on Mother's Day. So I'm very mindful of those things. Today is Father's Day. Donuts with Dads follows the worship service this morning. There are wonderful announcements in the bulletin this morning to which I call your attention. There will be a concert this afternoon in this sanctuary at 3 p.m. The San Antonio Recorder Quartet, as announced in this bulletin on page 14, will hold forth this afternoon again, 3 p.m. One of my favorite announcements is Read Through the Bible. This Tuesday is one of my favorite days of the week. Tuesday, 7 p.m. You don't have to be a, a biblical scholar. I have read every piece, but if you wish to join us, everyone is welcome. 7 p.m. via Zoom. One week from today, our congregational annual meeting will take place following the worship service. That is next Sunday. Today uh, also has other uh, meaning. It is a federal holiday that remembers Juneteenth, the Emancipation Proclamation, was signed by Abraham Lincoln on the 1st of January, 1863. But that message did not get through to all the slave-holding states. It was on the 19th of June in 1865 that a major general of the United States, a prestigious place to be, a major general, as one is seated in our congregation this morning, a major general named Gordon Granger sailed into Galveston Harbor and brought message along with about 6,000 infantry that all enslaved persons in Texas as well, since Texas had become a haven for slaveholders during those, those years from 1863 to 1865. Eventually, that message would get through, but not really until after harvest season, interestingly. But we remember, of course, that in December of that year, in 1865, the 13th Amendment forbade enslavement of persons in the United States of America. So we celebrate what has become Juneteenth, a celebration of the liberation of Americans. Other announcements include a week, uh, less than a week, six days, on June 25th, we will celebrate a rite of ordination to a ministry of word and service for Lisa Diana, a member of our congregation and seminary graduate. That will be June 25th, 10 a.m. here. And congratulations to Lisa and her family. Superb summer music. I want to thank every voice and instrument that blesses our worship seasons throughout the liturgical year. Dr. Dan Long, every voice and instrument, Jeff, our organist, who has prepared superb summer music, and I am preceding that with these announcements that we may sit and listen with gratitude and worshipful preparation as he begins with our prelude.
I invite the congregation to stand as able as we continue with the call to worship. Break down the barriers that divide us, O oh Lord. Tear down the walls of hostility and fear. Melt the barbed wire of anger and hatred. Breathe new life into your people, O oh God. For we are called to newness in Christ Jesus. We are all brothers and sisters through God's love. Come, let us worship the God who removes obstacles from our paths. Let us praise God who seeks to unite us in peace. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us pray. O oh Lord God, we bring before you the cries of a sorrowing world. 
In your mercy, set us free from the chains that bind us and defend us from everything that is evil. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. You may be seated for the readings. The first reading is from the 65th chapter of Isaiah. I was ready to be sought out by those who did not ask, to be found by those who did not seek me. I said, here I am, here I am, to a nation that did not call on my name. I held out my hands all day long to a rebellious people who, uh, who walk in a way that is not good following their own devices, a people who provide me to my face continually, sacrificing in gardens and offering incense on bricks, who sit inside tombs and spend the night in secret places, who eat swine flesh and broth of abominable things in their vessels, who say, keep to yourself, do not come near me, for I am too holy for you. These are smoke in my nostrils, a fire that burns all day long. See, it is written before me, I will not keep silent, but I will repay. I will indeed repay into their laps, their iniquities and their ancestors' iniquities together, says the Lord because they offered incense on the mountains and reviled me on the hills. I will measure into their laps full payment for their actions. Thus says the Lord, as the wine is found in the cluster and they say, do not destroy it for there is blessing in it. So I will do for my servants sake and not destroy them all. I will bring forth descendants from Jacob and from Judah inheritors of my mountains. My chosen shall inherit it, and my servants shall settle there. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The second reading is from the third chapter of Galatians. Now before faith came, we were imprisoned and guarded under the law until faith would be revealed. Therefore, the law was our disciplinarian until Christ came, so that we might be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we are no longer subject to a disciplinarian. For in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. As many of you as were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is no longer Jew or Greek. There is no longer slave or free. There is no longer male or female. For all of you are one in Christ Jesus. And if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. The word of the Lord. At this time, we'd like to invite forward all of our children to meet with Miss Carrie for a special message for our children. Hi, Carrie. Hi, this is Carrie. part of our creation series Hi. this summer where How we're focusing you? on well, caring for the earth. In my bucket. Are you guys going to come Don't forward? Well, good morning. It is. Good morning. Have a few more friends coming up. Good morning, everybody. Well, before we get started, what is today? What is today? It's Father's Day. So can we look out and say Happy Father's Day to all the fathers here and give them a big round of applause for being awesome dads? Happy Father's Day. Well, let's give them a big clap because they're amazing. Well, this 
summer, we have a theme, and it's all about God's creation. Did God create everything that's around us? Yeah. Did he create the animals in this earth? So our job is to what? As we live on earth, what is our job? What do you think, Benny? That's right. We have to keep our environment healthy and safe. So with me today, what is this? What do you, do you, have you guys ever seen this blue bin before? Right? We've seen it, right? Henry, have you seen this? Yep. We have them all around church, right? We have one right outside. We have one in the crossway. Your mommy has one in her office, right? So we're going to talk about paper stuff, stuff that, paper goods that you can put in here. So I have some stuff in here that we can put into it. And you guys can do this at home, but you guys can do it at church. So some of those things that we can put in here is one big one that we use a lot on Sundays is our bulletins can go in there, right, Henry? What about this, Henry? What's this? Bennett, what's this? What is this, guys? Paper bag, right? Can we put this paper bag in there? We can. What about a folder? We could put that in there. What about catalogs and magazines? We get lots of these at church. I bet you guys get lots of these at home. Can we put this in there? We can. What about Sophia worship notes? At the end, you can put those in there, right? And just like at home, I don't know, but don't tell Mr. Jeff, but I get a lot of Amazon packages. The church does too. So can those boxes go in here? We can dump that in there too. And at church, we like to drink coffee. What about our creamer? Can this go in there? It actually, it can. It just has to be emptied out. And that can go in here as well. Right? And in Miss Lori's room. That's right. She has one of these buckets too. And today after worship, we're having what? What are we eating after worship? Those little round things. What are those called? Donuts. Donuts. <laughs> That's right. And donuts come in a box, don't they? Do you know that box can go in here as well? So what our job is going to be this summer is to make sure that we recycle the things that are in our church that we can recycle so that we can keep what God gave us safe and clean. Can we all do that? And how the church is going to be a part of this and try to be an example and witness is we're going to try this summer to use those other red books that are in your pews. Can somebody hold one of those up for me? Does anybody see those other red books in your pews? Nope, the other ones. The other ones. <laughs> the Bible, yes. <laughs> we're going to use our pew Bibles this summer, and we're going to not put the readings in the bulletins, but instead use our pew Bibles and, and try to challenge ourselves that way to conserve some paper. And the other thing we're going to do is we're going to try some already recycled paper to use as our base paper. It's 30% recycled, so it's not too dark. We're going to try it out. We're going to see what we think and see if those are some ways that we can help take care of our earth and set an example for our kids as they do as well. Exactly. Let, why don't we close in prayer real fast? Can we close in prayer? Dear God, we are so thankful for your gift of creation. We promise you that we will take care of your earth. In your name we pray, and all God's children say, Amen. You guys can go be seated. Holy Gospel according to Luke, the eighth chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Then Jesus and his disciples arrived at the country of the Gerasenes, which is opposite Galilee. As he stepped out on land, a man of the city who had demons met him. For a long time he had worn no clothes. He did not live in a house 
but in the tombs. When he saw Jesus, he fell down before him and shouted at the top of his voice, What have you to do with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I beg you, do not torment me. For Jesus had commanded the unclean spirit to come out of the man. For many times it had seized him. He was kept under guard and bound with chains and shackles, but he would break the bonds and be driven by the demon into the wilds. Jesus then asked him, What is your name? He said, Legion, for many demons had entered him. They begged him not to order them to go back into the abyss. Now there on the hillside, a large herd of swine was feeding, and the demons begged Jesus to let them enter these, so he gave them permission. Then the demons came out of the man and entered the swine, and the herd rushed down the steep bank into the lake and was drowned. When the swine herd saw what had happened, they ran off and told it in the city and in the country. Then people came out to see what had happened, and when they came to Jesus, they found the man from whom the demons had gone, sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed and in his right mind. And they were afraid. Those who had seen it told them how the one who had been possessed by demons had been healed. Then all the people of the surrounding country of the Gerasenes asked Jesus to leave them, for they were seized with great fear. So he got into the boat and returned. The man from whom the demons had gone begged that he might be with him. But Jesus sent him away, saying, Return to your home and declare how much God has done for you. So he went away, proclaiming throughout the city how much Jesus had done for him. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, O Christ. You may be seated. It was in Trempolo County, Wisconsin, with a friend of mine, an ELCA pastor named John Clausen. We initiated a ministry with inmates of the Trempolo County Jail in Whitehall, Wisconsin. We did so because, as I remember, one of my friend John's parishioners wound up in the stir. And when he visited them, he realized that there were really no provisions made for the pastoral care or the respect for the religious freedoms of those who were incarcerated in the Trempolo County Jail. So we received permission to begin a ministry with those persons who were inmates, at least the men. We were allowed to visit the men. And I remember my first time when I went to that jail. It was scary for me. Never had I been inside a correctional facility of any kind. The only experience I had was... Uh, Maybe James Cagney movies or something, prison movies. It's all I knew about incarcerated persons or life behind bars. I recall going for my very first visit and going out to the Trempolo County uh, Jail. It's, I always knew what it was because it still had bars on the outside windows and translucent glass so that light could come in to some extent that no one could see in. And as I got out of my car and approached that facility, I thought, why did I ever want to do this? Whatever came upon us, John was not there. This was my first occasion. So I went up there thinking, well, maybe, maybe it's going to be closed on Sunday. Maybe they won't allow me in on Sunday. I had all this bargaining going on in my mind. If you've ever had the experience of something to which you have agreed and then subsequently thought, well, that's a bad idea. And when I approached the place, I had to encounter that disinclination that was within me, not the propriety of the ministry, it was my own inner process with which I had to contend. And the one who greeted me, the jailer, was like a, a dude out of a cast. Just what I expected for a rural uh, Midwestern county jailer. Who He even had sunglasses on when he answered the door. <laughs> he was big, as tall as I and as rotund as perhaps to obscure the gun belt around his waist, giving testimony, I believe, to the brew that made Milwaukee famous. <laughs> He's older. He smiled at the young cleric who idealistically had long hair. I did. 
lots of it, and a beard. It's like another dude whom you would not recognize. And he welcomed me in with a rather exaggerated articulation of hospitality that said, come on in. <laughs> Read me very clearly. The place had a smell I would never forget. To this day I remember the intense pine cleaner smell. Do you remember that smell? Mix that. Intense, strong odor. I won't give it the compliment of fragrance. With human sweat. Man sweat. Stinky socks. I'll leave it at that. Took me into this room that was bound, I guess, architecturally by a heavy steel door, surrounded by other heavy steel doors with glass within as thick as my fist, reinforced with wire inside. Strong smell. Fresh paint. I think you get the picture. The place is in my mind as strongly as any memory I've had. When the inmates came in, and I remember the smiling big jailer, Tremplo County Sheriff's deputy, smiled at me, young and idealistic, and said, they're all yours. <laughs> I would have chosen to give a year's salary to not be in that place at that moment. But there I was, captured by John Clausen and my vision that maybe we could do some good. I sat and I, I just got up, I met everyone, I learned their names, and I came back. Time after time, but I think it took years before I could deal well with the smell, with the ambiance of that place, but most of all with the conflictedness within. As I could see, each one of them saw anyone who had come in there as a threat, not as a helper, but what does this dude want? Why is he here? During one of my visits, not the first one, I remember I lost the attention of my little congregation as something was happening over my left shoulder. And I remember looking at them, they were looking over here, and I looked around and I saw another inmate being escorted down a hallway behind some other heavy metal doors with thick glass. He was wearing almost nothing. He was shackled in his, his feet and handcuffed and chains to his handcuffs around his waist. He wore only the tiniest of little garment. And he had a deputy in front, a deputy behind, and one on either side. It became very quiet in the room as the other inmates looked at him. And I inquired, what is going on? And they explained to me that even in Trempolo County, there was what they called the hole. That if an inmate was particularly ill-behaved, quarrelsome, or violent, he wound up in that solitary situation. He's allowed out for one hour a day, and it was supervised just to be outside, shackled, handcuffed. And they looked at him with a kind of tacit, almost jailhouse respect. Don't mess with him. As I looked, turned around and looked, and I saw a face that looked back at me that I remember to this very day. I'll never forget the penetrating look that spoke more threateningly than I could imagine. I remember that to this day because I saw it again. I saw it again in 2013 when I was in Afghanistan. I went with Don Rutherford and Mark Tidd, my partners, my uh, peers in the Army and the Navy, respectively. We went to Afghanistan during Holy Week of 2013. I don't know if it was a good idea. I think we made a good target, and we got back safely. But what a rich target to hit the three senior clergy of the American Department of Defense. We went to a place where, not far from, I, I guess it would be the capital of Afghanistan, Kabul, and the air base there, where we were holding POWs. The three of us walked through, I think that's where they paraded visiting military dignitaries. We went through the place where we kept the Taliban prisoners of war. They were in cages. And they looked at us the same way that I remember when I, 30 years before, when I saw the guy leave the hole and be taken outdoors with disdain and with a measure of fear and that we were really threats to them. We weren't messengers of salvation. <laughs> a glance over that shoulder returned to me and I still remember the faces of all of them. The prisoners of war were kept by American service members, American Air Force, security forces, and Army military police. 
As that tour proceeded through that secure installation, I realized these again, people who regarded me as a threat. The images of that inmate, men held in desert prison in Afghanistan, men who are held in prisons elsewhere, I realized that those persons don't always have a very good life when the doors close. We know what happened to military prisoners of war under American care. Enhanced interrogation, some called it. It's torture. You don't have to be a military scholar of history to know what happened at Abu Ghraib when they were stripped naked and physically tortured, especially by women, which would be even more humiliating for Muslim men. I remember them all. I remember these experiences this morning not because they're unique, but because they're common. The image of shackled men and haunted eyes came to me this week as I read again this gospel from Luke's 8th chapter, which you might have in front of you as I finish this morning. There was a man who was possessed by demons, Luke tells us, and he was shackled, handcuffed. For what reason? I'm not exactly clear. Because he was a threat? Because he was scary? Had he committed some crime that he would be punished physically? But he was shackled. He lived out in, in the wild because the demons would drive him out there. He would break his shackles, break his handcuffs and chains. He was kept under guard and bound with chains, it says in the 29th verse. But he would break the bonds and be driven by the demon into the wilds. Luke doesn't tell much more about this man. We don't know his name or if he committed some crime, but he was objectified. People looked at him. They stared at him. Kind of like that dude who walked behind me when I was doing my ministry with the inmates. Staring, objectified, odd. And the people, Luke tells us, they were scared. They were scared of him. And when Jesus healed him, they were scared of Jesus. Something so extraordinary. The story goes on to say when the man saw Jesus, he fell down before him. In that gesticulation of, of humility, of I'm a lower social place than you, I'm a fall down before Jesus, is exactly what he did. And he shouts out in a loud voice, he says, what have you to do with me? A piece of refuse that I am. As Jesus cast the demon out from him. And the word he said to Jesus, he said, do not torment me. The word is basilanesas from basil, basil, basanazo. It means torture. That's what the word means. He shouts out to Jesus, don't torture me. Because he had experienced torture. Torture from within, that which possessed him, which was identified in the worldview of the time as a demon. He heard voices. He was physically possessed by something he could not overcome. He had been tortured from within, and I suspect if he was shackled and chained, he was tortured from without. Around him were always threats. Jesus, don't be one of those. I think it tells us that's what he experienced, was a threat from without because of his differentness. Here again from the gospel, Jesus says to him, what's your name? We don't really find out his name because that with was within him, spoke out and said, Legion, for there were many. He doesn't even get to speak his name. And Jesus engages that which has captivated him, sends it into the herd of swine, and there's the rest of that story. The central message to me of the Gospel reading today, many people are bound. Many people are confined, chained, shackled, can be from without, can be in a confinement facility. It can be from within ourselves, that which possesses us that which we cannot overcome on our own. How many times I have experienced times of intimate pastoral care with persons who have been bound, maybe by addiction or by behaviors they simply cannot control. The central message of today's gospel is that God's grace intends through Christ to identify us by name, bring us healing, and charges us to go and tell others what God has done for you. That, I believe, is the map and the path for Christ Lutheran Church. Two things before I close. In my reading this past week, I encountered a quote from the great Nelson Mandela, a liberator who spent more than 20 years of his life chained. 
and incarcerated for his works to liberate people in South Africa. He wrote from prison, to be free is not merely to cast off one's chains, but to live in a way that respects and enhances the freedom of others, to liberate them from their captivity. I will always remember that as a mission for the church. How do we then access that grace? How can we at Christ Lutheran Church access the grace that liberates, heals, and sends us forth? I first look today at the gospel and the example of the man. What's the first thing he did? Is he threw himself down before Jesus. That is an image that is compelling to me to this day. In Asian culture, it is a custom in the presence of a person of a more senior social standing to lower oneself, to lower one's head. It's a gesture of respect. It is a profound gesture of respect when he threw himself down before Jesus. I think that is figuratively, if not literally, the call to faith from this gospel today, to throw ourselves down before Jesus. One of the greatest Baptist theologians I've ever read is a fellow named Harvey Morrison Pennock. Harvey Morrison Pennock has sold the most books of any writer of his type. He writes about golf. The greatest golf writer of all time. Maybe the greatest teacher of golf of all time. He wrote, there are times in life golf taught him when things just aren't going your way. When you're stuck, you can't fix it. Golf's a great humbler of human beings, men and women, because it's impossible to completely conquer. At times you simply can't do it. You can't make happen what you want to happen. He says it'll happen in every profession, whether you are a musician, a physician, an electrician, whatever it is that you do there, sometimes you just can't do it and you feel bound and constrained. And he says, Harvey Pennick says, there are times in my life when I have been so stuck, so bound, all I can do is let it go. Throw myself down before Jesus. That's what he says. A great Baptist theologian. It's an image for all of us to let it go and give it to the Lord. And secondly, as I close, Jesus makes very clear to the man he healed in the story that healing means being restored by and to community. I don't believe there is anything such as a solitary Christian. We gain faith, we are nurtured in faith, we die in faith in community with one another. I learned this very clearly on the 1st of June when I went to a screening at Santicos Theater here in San Antonio. It was a screening of a film called Beyond Homelessness. The story of the efforts of the wealthiest city in the United States, San Francisco, to deal with its homeless population and the failure of their initiative to find housing first. They spent huge amounts, huge investment in simply getting people indoors but it repeatedly, over time, failed. They spent huge amount of resources trying to get people inside. The more they did, the bigger the homeless population became until they found a model that works. Where did they find the model? San Antonio, Texas. The film is about Haven for Hope and the model of community for healing. For being without shelter means a lot more than not having a place to sleep that's air-conditioned when it's 105 degrees outside or it's 20 below in Minneapolis. It has to do with a condition of being bound and being shackled, perhaps by addiction or by illness or some other confining experience from which a person needs to be liberated. And the only way beyond homelessness discovered in this research is community. To be healed by a whole community of San Antonio, for example, where Haven for Hope is not just a place to put people indoors, but to deal with their whole person. That calls, gathers, enlightens, and sanctifies, if I dare say, the whole person and brings healing in community. I believe that's what Luke is trying to teach us this morning. Number one, to teach us through the story of this man's healing that we throw ourselves down before the Lord in the times when we're stuck and can find no healing. And Jesus casts out the demon with the grace of God that is everlasting. When it comes to us, we throw ourselves down before the sacrament of baptism. We're nurtured at the Lord's table when we receive God's word. And we are healed in a community together. A community that follows Jesus not by departing everything in our life, but Jesus says, no, return to your home. Go home. 
Go home and tell everyone what God has done for you. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Amen. confess our faith together using the words of the Apostles Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, 
was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. I invite the congregation to kneel as able for our prayers. United in Christ and guided by the Spirit, we pray for the church, creation, and all in need. Holy God, you hear the cries of all those who seek you, of all those bound in chains. Equip your church with evangelists to reveal the continuous call of your outstretched hands and your promises of grace and a home in you. God of grace, you hear the cries of the earth. Restore places where land, air, and waterways have been harmed. Guide us to develop and implement sources of energy and food production that do not destroy the earth. God of grace, you hear the cries of those who are marginalized or cast out. On this Juneteenth observance, guide us continually toward the end of oppression in all its forms. Bring true freedom and human flourishing to all your beloved children. God of grace. You hear the cries of those who suffer. Come to the aid of all who are homeless, naked, hungry, and we pray in particular today for our sick and ill, especially Maggie and Margaret Bilderback, Rosemary Stewart, Hugh Gray, Jamie Elrod, Dave McRory, Claudia Robeson, Roberta Leichnitz, Alan Stryker, Paul Fleming, Xavier Cervantes, Stan Long, Chandra Singh, Orlene Colm, Margie Douglas, John Ferris, Marjorie Earp, and Robert Bastian. Bring peace to any experiencing illness that they can clearly recognize your loving presence walking with them, God of grace. You hear the cries of joy of all those who celebrate on this Father's Day. Fathers, grandfathers, uncles, godfathers, mentors, teachers, all who have been a fathering presence in your lives, for them we give you thanks. You also hear the cries of those who grieve on this Father's Day for some broken relationship or loss. We pray that you would nurture mutual love and tender care in all relationships and comfort those for whom this day brings sadness or longing. God of grace, we give thanks for the faithful departed whose lives proclaimed all you had done for them. At the last, unite us with them as we make our home in you, God of grace. God of every time and place, in Jesus' name and filled with your Holy Spirit, we entrust these spoken prayers and those in our hearts into your holy keeping. Amen. The congregation may be seated as we continue with the offering. Oh. 
Let us pray together, Holy God, as we remember the strength of your love and the promise of Christ's help, let us share who we are as the church in the world. With open arms, let us join with one another as we express our faith through our gifts of love. Amen. <clears throat>
the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and gave thanks. He broke it, and he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Let us pray together the prayer our Lord taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The Lord's table is prepared. Come, for all are welcome.
And now may the body and blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. Let us pray together. Life-giving God, through this meal, you have bandaged our wounds and fed us with your mercy. Now send us forth to live for others, both friend and stranger, that all may come to know your love. This we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord's face shine on you with grace and with mercy. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. in peace, serve the Lord.